Hi everyone, welcome to our 10th virtual community session. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Haley Visitor and I'm a member of our communications team here at KMK. If you've seen in the past, you know that we are doing these virtually because, well, COVID-19. Let's hope that changes in the future very soon. So our plan is to hold a session each month featuring a different department at KMK. Each of these are recorded and posted to our YouTube and Facebook pages. So I encourage you to check them out. And as mentioned in the past, it's important to us that we are informing the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia. So with that, we will be holding these sessions at different times on different days to see what works, what works best for you. Also, we will be issuing a newsletter that features all of our departments the same week. So if you'd like to be on our distribution list for our newsletters, media releases, or any other items, you can always let us know through our email at info at .com, or simply visit our website and go to the contact us form at Mi'kmaqRights.com. So this month, our folks, sorry. So this month, our session will focus on an overview of our forestry department from Sherilyn Young, who is a part of the consultation team. At the end of her presentation, I will help take questions from all of you through the chat feature. So right now, let me turn things over to Sherilyn. Hi, Haley, how are you? Hi. Um, so Haley, do you mind sharing the slideshow? Do you have it available to you? Yes, let me bring that up for you. So hi everyone, um, as a Haley mentioned or earlier, my name is Sherilyn Young and I'm a member of the consultation team. I'm also an experienced forester and I've worked on the, on the land for many, many years. Um, so today's topic is we'll be, we'll be discussing forestry and, and KMK and all its involvement in forestry. Next slide. So as you may be aware, we practice in a duclimic and, for, and, and in forestry, that means economic well-being without jeopardizing the integrity, diversity, or productivity of our environment. As Mi'kmaq, we have an inherent right to access and use our resources, and we have a responsibility to use those resources in a sustainable manner. This holistic view encompasses all aspects of the forest, acknowledging that the forest is a complex entity. In order to accomplish this, we work closely with UINR, the Unamagi Institute of Natural Resources, and CMM, the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, as active members of the Mi'kmaq Forest Advisory Committee. My role within KMK and OAS specifically is to provide technical support to the chiefs and council and the communities where needed, and to provide briefings on the projects under my scope of responsibility. Next slide. So some of the projects that we're participating in are insects, uh, provincial harvest, the Mi'kmaq forestry initiative, the future of forest management in Nova Scotia, projects under, the, under Environment Climate Change Canada, for example, Ale Oat, uh, Indigenous protected and conserved areas, old growth establishment, Wisco and trail trees. Next slide. So why insects, right? In, invasive insects have the potential to drastically change our forest. It's important here to mention that invasive does not always mean exotic. An invasive animal can be any animal that no longer is living in harmony with its em environment. Insects can have serious impacts on the way we choose to practice our rights, thus engagement with our communities is vital. We may engage with our communities through webinars, on-site visits, interviews, etc. These are intended to be informative and to give community members the tools that they need to identify if there's an invasive in their area. Engagement with our communities also allow us to address any concerns that you may have with an insect that's in your area or mitigation efforts that have been proposed by the province. It can help us ensure that your rights are being protected. While there are others, some of the invasive insects that are taking the headlines are the spruce budworm, hemlock willy delgit, and emerald ash borer. Next slide. So not everybody gets as excited about insects as what I do. Um, so I'm going to refer to this moth as a, a, a very beautiful looking moth. Uh, but this beautiful looking moth is the spruce budworm. It is the most broadly distributed forest defoliator in Canada. And today it's caused more damage to Nova Scotian for coniferous forest than any other insect. 
However, forest management can in part be to blame for the damage that's associated with this insect. Um, for example, large monocultures of balsam fir and white spruce are ideal feeding grounds for, this, for the hungry instars of this insect. A severe outbreak can destroy up to 90% of a softwood stand if its species composition is made up of balsam fir and white spruce and upwards to 50% of uh, other spruces. So red spruce and black spruce aren't exactly safe from this insect. Um, spruce outbreaks, uh, spruce budworm outbreaks occur every 30 to 40 years. The last outbreak was approximately 40 years ago, so we're anticipating another outbreak uh, again very soon. In September of 2020, the Mi'kmaq Forest Advisory Committee had been engaged by the government of Nova Scotia to participate in the spruce budworm management framework. This framework consists of six working groups the science working group, the social values working group, economic values working group, ecological values working group, operate, operations working group, and the communications and engagements working group. Some of the proposed intervention strategies have included spray-in, so BTK, uh, under the early intervention strategy and foliage protection. Uh, number two, to do nothing. Three, salvage harvest, so if an area had been heavily impacted, they would go in and harvest after the fact, um, or a modified uh, harvest schedule. As part of our engagement strategies, we are planning on holding three separate events throughout Nova Scotia to conduct interviews with elders and knowledge holders. These interviews will help us identify Mi'kmaq values that we may have missed, identify Mi'kmaq past and present concerns with probable spruce budworm mitigation methods, and identify invasive species prevention methods used in the past. In preparation of these interviews, we have completed a Mi'kmaq Ethics Watch application that was submitted on June 1st. We also drafted a consent form, which would inform all participants of their rights to their intellectual properties. Um, we've drafted a spruce budworm fact sheet, and we've drafted a terms of reference for ongoing participation within the spruce budworm working groups, all of which have been approved thus far underneath the assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs. Next slide. Hemlock woolly delchid. This uh, little insect is, is not quite as pretty, um, and it's, it's a very uh, wasteful feeder, or not so much of a wasteful feeder, but very, very, um, it can have an extreme impact. So hemlock willy delgit or HWA is an exotic invasive that specifically targets hemlocks. Um, this exotic invasive, this one in particular was suspected to come across um, on plantain stock from the, from the West Coast um, and, and eventually made its way up through to Nova Scotia. So it would have been planted somewhere in the East Coast um, and then East Coast United States and eventually made its way up to Nova Scotia. It was first noted in Nova Scotia in July of 2017. So hemlock woolly delgit, all hemlock woolly delgits are female and they develop asexually they, with two overlapping generations per year. So each adelgit can lay up to 300 lit eggs, which in turn can easily overwhelm a tree. So hemlock woolly delgit can be identified as by the white woolly sacs resembling tiny cotton swabs at the end of the base of each hemlock needles on the young twigs. And these are, always, these are most obvious in the spring. You can see them very clearly on the picture. So some key points to remember about hemlock woolly delgit are that hemlock woolly delgits are not wasteful feeders. Once the eggs hatch, the nymphs will begin to feed until the trees are overwhelmed before moving on to a new host. In Nova Scotia, feeding has been noted in all seasons. We're not really getting those extreme cold snaps that would stop um, the species from spreading. So we're noting feeding in all seasons now. And um, uh, although dieback can occur within extreme temperatures, again, we're not, we're not really seeing it. Um, invested hemlocks will die within four to 15 years. However, if you have a sapling or, or a tree that's about two to uh, four feet high, that tree is gonna be dead over a course of a couple of, a few months. In Nova Scotia, hemlock gully delgit has been noted to be traveling eight to 12 kilometers per year. Presently, it's been found in Yarmouth, Shelburne, Digby, Annapolis, and Lunenburg counties, moving northeast from hemlock stand to hemlock stand. So some of the intervention methods that have been proposed for hemlock woolly delgit include spraying, so the use of imidacloprid through uh, Cytac-2-F um, or, or other 
other uses. Um, inoculation, so the use of imidacloprid again uh, through inoculation, so Arborjet or Ecojet. Um, thin in, so that's that involves uh, harvesters going in and they can individually fall trees within a stand to open up that stand, allow light to come into that stand and allow regeneration for other species to come back in. Um, and, and biological control. So the Laracobis nigrinus is a beetle that's native to the Pacific Northwest and it feeds on over winter in hemlock woolly delta. It's not yet in the province and there has been no research um, about non-target non impacts of these insects. So we're planning on hosting a few webinars for hemlock woolly delta to help inform our communities on how to properly identify and prepare for a hemlock woolly delta outbreak in their area. Additionally, we're asking for communities to identify specific old growth forest of, in, of interest for either preservation or, or to just stay out of. We acknowledge that some individuals may wish to allow nature to take its course. So some of the areas, there, there are a few trials uh, occurring right now for cytac 2 f because it is not a proved chemical um, in Canada, but it is cost effective and it is effective against hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, so there are a few trials that are occurring right now. One is in, in Silver Lake um, at where they have just sprayed a few trees with cytac 2 f at a basal bark spray in, in, dry, in a dry, time, so dry period, so obviously not today with all of this rain, um, but they've also inoculated a few trees. With the ongoing research, we should be able to identify if there's any impacts uh, from this and other pesticides that might be being used against that um, and that uh, against hemlock woolly delta on any other species within the forest, or if um, or if there's residual uh, protection from root graft or the my mycelium that or in micro or say that's laying underneath the earth's surface that's connecting all of our trees together. Next slide. So although uh, Emerald Ash Borer, although we're yet to receive any form of formal consultation on EAB to date, it's important to acknowledge this insect because it, is, it causes mortality amongst our ash trees, including Wis Wisco. Engagement with our community so far has only come through uh, CMM via an invitation to an EAB um, outside awareness activity, whereby they actually invited uh, community members and members of the public to go down and uh, see a tree that had been infested with EAB, um, and also to take a look at the, a closer look at the insects so that um, the, the public would be able to identify in the future. Um, we're also planning on providing a webinars to communities to aid in identifications of the species for community members. Emerald ash borer was first discovered in Nova Scotia in 2018. So once a tree is infested, there's about a 75% chance of mortality. If your tree is stressed, um, that, that chance of mortality increases. Next slide. So why care about all of these insects? Well, it's hard to imagine that such a small animal could have such a huge impact on the environment. However, it's so important not to underestimate these beings. And because these insects will kill their host trees, it's, there can be a number of unintentional impacts. Some of these impacts could include ecosystem species and habitat change. So if you, for example, if we have hemlock woolly adelgid in a particular stand, um, that stand is going to be completely different. If we don't have any vegetation growing up underneath, we could look at a large grassland once hemlock woolly delta has moved through. Um, impacts to your ground stabilization. So once again, going back to hemlock woolly delta, we have large uh, old growth forests of hemlock. If these forests are uh, ultimately ultimately destroyed by hemlock woolly delta, what we're going to end up with is large standing dead timber um, that can be blown down or can cause fires because it's now is an additional fuel load. Um, and if it is blowing down, we could we could expect to see that root mass also come up, which would in, which would in turn uh, cause that ground disturbance um, and impacts to your water quality. So again, if these trees are within a riparian zone in that area of which which is um, which is adjacent to your watercourse. 
if those trees blow down or if those trees no longer exist and there's not a healthy population of regeneration to come back and, and protect that riparian zone, we could expect to see uh, sedimentation go into the water course. We could expect to see um, fluctuations of water height uh, because we don't have those trees are natural suckers. So we don't have enough of those natural uh, drinkers to, to suck back that water or to properly distribute that, that water flow. So we'll have fluctuations of water uh, whereby you might have had uh, a really low amount of water going through a water course. You might now have like a quite a large uh, bit of water going through water course, create and flood in. Um, this will also mean changes to your sacred areas. Uh, such as burial grounds and ceremonial sites, we have ground disturbance, uh, spirit being areas, archaeological sites, exposure again, um, traditional use areas, teaching areas, fishing and hunting sites. The animals that we hunt on the land are there because that habitat is specific to their needs. So if their needs are no longer being met, that animal is going to move to a new location. If the all of their habitat is, some, some animals are very specific to us, a, a type of habitat, if that habitat is destroyed, that animal will have nowhere to go. Um, so it, 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 can, it can cause a deterioration in their health as well. Uh, medicinal food and decorative ceremonial foraging. Uh, we've already touched on water recreation, such as hunting, hiking areas could be impacted by either loss of habitat or it may no longer be safe for you to enter those areas. And economics, such as tourism and the forestry industry. Um, all insects can travel through the movement of any wood, including firewood, so it's vital to know what you're harvesting and where you're harvesting it from. If you're concerned that there may be an invasive in your local area, the technical staff at KMK, CMM, and UINR are always available to provide answers to any of your questions. Next slide. Um, the future of forest management in Nova Scotia. So KMKNO, along with other active members of the FAC, have been working closely with the province to implement a new forest model in Nova Scotia. This was triggered by the report by Professor, Professor William Leahy titled An Independent Review of Forest Practices in Nova Scotia. The future of forest management in Nova Scotia will be comprised of three main components. Uh, con conservation areas, the Silvicultural Guide to the Ecological Matrix, and High Production Forestry. So consultation on the future forest management in Nova Scotia remains active as we work together to start an implementation of the SGEM, the Silvicultural Guide to the Ecological, uh, e Ecological Matrix. Um, high production forest will be designated and managed with intensive silvicultural practices that will increase the quantity and high value of high value timber products, whereas the conservation zone is intended to legislate protected areas in addition to ecological important and sensitive areas. The old forest will not be considered under timber product management and they will be core, core features in the protection of biodiversity. And finally, under the ecological matrix that will be managed for both timber and biodiversity. So through the application of the ecological forestry practices, this practice should create forests that are comprised of mixed uneven and longer lived forests. So it's something that you could expect to see on, on a more natural landscape. Ultimately, this would be similar to forest conditions created from a natural disturbance regimes uh, typical to the province. Next slide. Harvest. So to date, provincial harvest. Today, Cam Cano has been responded to review requests from the Crown specific to West Fork, the Western Harvest Reviews, and Port Hawkesbury paper. A review process is reliant on data collected in the past and present present years to identify areas of significance and concerns. At this time, we're identifying areas of concern by three levels to ensure that intellectual property remain, rights remain protected. So these levels are low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. So moderate and high risk are immediately identified as no-go zones. An example of a low risk area would be an area with like an excess amount of a particular value, i.e. deer hunting. Um, however, we would work with the province to determine a management strategy that would ensure that that value is protected and able 
and able to continue to flourish within that area. Whereas an example of a high risk area could be in a burial ground where we would immediately determine that no har harvest operations could occur within that area. Through Mi'kmaq community engagement, our database is growing and we are working together with our GIS specialists to, to develop a program um, to identify future or, or uh, values that may, we might be missing. Uh, next slide. Mi'kmaq Forestry Initiative. So to date, KMKNO are the license holder for the MFI lands, but the stars of this show uh, our CMM and UINR. And I really have to give props to Elizabeth Jessam from UINR and Troy Robichaud from CMM here because they are, they've been absolute champions throughout this whole process. Um, CMM and UINR have been working hard to ensure that Nduculumic is practiced on our MFI lands. Through community engagement, they also ensure that the values that are being managed on these lands are not strictly industrial. So what do we do? We provide both uh, technical and administrative and support uh, for, for the MFI. And this means we're aiding in management plan development through our experience, we are able to provide support by reviewing and providing documentation. Um, we also review over any of the harvest blocks that they, they may be proposing with the use of our database. Um, so we screen all of the blocks for any risk as we would do with uh, any provincial proponents. And ground truth in. So if a red flag has been identified via our initial screen, we can then ground truth, meaning that we'll physically walk the block to identify the, the red flag so that we can properly preserve that traditional value on the land. We also provide boots on the ground to identify traditional uses that might not have been identified through initial screening by other parties. Uh, next slide. Eastern lands MFI. Our Eastern lands are made up of approximately 10,200 hectares of a variety of mixed forests, as well as some red spruce, white spruce, and abundance of balsam bark, uh, similar to that of a boreal forest type. UINR is working to uh, remediate the lands that have been previously managed under PHB. The future of forest management on these lands will be dependent on an engagement with communities. We want to know what you expect from these forests. So some community members have already shown interest um, in these forests and they've have requested that we leave burls and birch uh, for crafting materials while others uh, have more of an inter interest in an industrial scope. Next slide. So while at mainland MFI, um, while we're managing for more than just industry, we have to acknowledge that we do still have to gain some profit from from the site. So thus some operations that you could expect to see are individual tree selection, commercial thinning, pre-commercial thinning, irregular shelter wood. But this does not mean that we're depleting the resource. Um, we're keeping our retention levels high at, at about 70% and we're protecting our water courses at about a 50 to 80 meter plus water course buffers. We are getting to know our land base and we're getting to know it very well. So presently CMM is managing about 20 hectares of forested land. Um, the final number again is to, to be decided as well as, uh, as well as the Eastern lands. So I have personally have had the opportunity to walk the St. Croix portion of these lands many times and the potential for value on this site is absolutely outstanding. Uh, firstly, we have mature hemlock stands with patches of hardwood, birch, ironwood, maple, and amongst those, we've noted chaga, oysters, reshi, birch polypore, gold thread, and so much more. We have stands of mature red spruce with mixed hardwood that have large out rock, rock outcrops as well, which is um, important for biodiversity. And the aesthetics of the location is just incredible. So as we grow in this industry, we'll be looking for other uses of this land and increase in community involvement. Next slide. So Environment Climate Change Canada, L out. Um, so KMKNO has been working with Environment Climate Change Canada to co-manage islands, three islands off the coast of Nova Scotia. Those include Country Island, St. Paul's Islands, and Illout. Most of our research to date has been done on Illout. The focus of our research has been species and habitat threat abatement, meaning that we will be looking for anything invasive that could, track, uh, could be on track for the mainland of Nova Scotia, 
or any species that can be threatened in the current habitat of ill oat. We would also be identifying any ecosystem types which would allow us to determine what might have been on site when the, when the site was used by the Mi'kmaq. We, we are um, looking at Mi'kmaq ecological knowledge, meaning that we would be looking for vegetation on the island that would be used by the Mi'kmaq for any purpose. Uh, we're also conducting archaeological surveys um, to see if we can identify, identify any important features that further tie the Mi'kmaq to the land. And we'll be conducting elder outreach um, to get a verbal history of the land base. All of the information collected will be a part of a greater report that is ultimately captures the importance of, uh, of this and of Ilot and the other Allworthy Islands. Uh, next slide. So this is our team. Um, we're, we're a goofy looking crew, um, but uh, we get the job done and we get the job done well. So in order to conduct the research, we developed a multidisciplinary team comprised of experts in each field. So myself and Craig reviewed the vegetation and looked for traditional use areas, while Caitlin, our archaeologist, looked for archaeological sites, and Kevin, our GIS specialist and tech <laughs> technological hero, um, documented and geo-referenced all of our findings. Tamara and Ted were there to offer support with their keen eyes and knowledge of the islands. Ilot has been has proven itself to be um, immensely challenging and and greatly rewarding. So next slide. Thanks, Haley. Indigenous protected and conserved areas. The initiative is led by the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, with four organizations coordinating the work the Unamagi Institute of Natural Resources, the Confederacy of the Mainland Mi'kmaq, Askasoni Fish and Wildlife Commission, and Gumagua uh, Magolas uh, the KMK No. We have been working to identify and preserve areas that are significant to the Mi'kmaq for the Mi'kmaq. As part of this continuum work, our, our, sorry, I'm gonna just grab a quick drink of water because I feel like I've been talking forever. So part of this continuum work is involvement in IPCA uh, committee meetings where we provide administrative and technical support. Um, and this can look like anything like delineation of the land, so identification of traditional and archaeological sites through our database uh, for consideration and policy review. Next slide. Old growth. So KMKNO has been working with the Mi'kmaq Forest Advisory Committee to review and provide feedback on the old growth forest policy. Some changes that we have been re recommending are the views that qualify for old growth and additional old growth forests that require protection. So for example, we've had the opportunity to bring the change in forest types of Nova Scotia to qualify for old growth. Some species that might not have been considered, um, for example, boreal forest, were not considered under the old growth forest policy, but however, due to borealization of our forest, boreal forests are now in Nova Scotia. They are increasingly common on the Acadian landscape. Um, so that's just one example of how we've, we've been able to implement some change within this policy. Uh, next slide. Wisco. Wisco is probably one of my favorite files. Um, it's it's definitely one of my more challenging fi files, um, but it's definitely a favorite. So how are we protecting our Wisco? We're staying active on all of our Wisco files. So black ash has been a reoccurring element on a lot of our highway and forestry files. So every time a site is altered, we lose that specific habitat and all of the values that it holds. So it's so, so important to be preserving these habitats that, that Wisco lives in. Once again, um, I, I mentioned it before that, that these beings live in these habitats because these habitats are specific to their needs or their niches. Um, so we've been working closely with CMM uh, to develop a black ash protocol. Uh, this protocol will become a formal document that directs proponents on the next steps uh, should they encounter black ash on their work site. And some of those next steps include uh, proper identification of WISCO. So if they think that they might have found a WISCO, we're going to require pictures of buds, of leaves, of bark, 
um, and the, the overall site. Um, and if we're still not able to identify from those pictures, if it is indeed a, a black ash, we'll then do a site visit. Um, we're also asking for at least 150 meter buffer uh, around the tree, should the tree have been identified on a construction zone or um, on a highway path, et cetera. Uh, we're also participating in the recovery plan. This is new. Uh, we're, we're, we have just started participating in the recovery plan or recovery team for WISCO and, um, and we're, we're, we're really looking forward to it. Uh, but why WISCO? Why is black ash so important? So black ash and the Mi'kmaq have a long and loving relationship with one another. The Mi'kmaq traditionally use black ash to weave baskets and store supplies to travel. Um, snowshoe, they've also created snowshoes for winter travel, axe handles, canoe ribs, baby cradles, and hockey sticks. Um, once European settlers arrived, the Mi'kmaq sold these beautiful handmade baskets. Sorry. They were able to sell these beautiful handmade baskets um, to the settlers to, to gain some profit for themselves as well. Um, its wood is unique in that it allows, it's, it's able to be pounded and made into straps and permanently belt, allowing it to be this, uh, uh, shaped in any type of form. So for example, if you want to um, create a hockey stick, you can actually bend that wood and that wood can permanently be bent in that one particular shape. Um, Black ash has played a primary role in bedtime stories and, the, and in legends among the Mi'kmaq. It also has important medicinal properties. So just a few of those properties um, include uh, it being diaphoretic, diuretic, and a laxative. Uh, the phloem has also been used as a tonic for the liver and the stomach, um, also to treat pain, full urination, um, and an infusion of the phloem can be used as an eye wash to treat eye sores. Um, it's, it can also be beneficial in treating asthma and other respiratory issues. So it's, it's just all around an incredible tree. It's rarity in the province. Um, with the loss of every black ash through site alteration, we are losing that unique habitat. This habitat is capable of satisfying all of the, this tree's niche, niches. And uh, with just 12 known seed trees and a thousand trees in the province, it's not acceptable to continue to lose um, the habitat of this rare species. It's also super important for the importance of biodiversity of Nova Scotia's forest. Next slide. Okay, so trail trees. Trail trees is not something that's commonly known about in Nova Scotia, um, but it is, it's known about in every other province. So being on the land firsthand and, and being able to see these, it's, it's, it's really quite something that's done in. Um, so other names is uh, culturally modified trees or, or it falls under culturally modified trees, so CMTs, trail or thong trees, trail markers or whale or wayfinders. So culturally modified trees are trees that have been modified for a specific purpose by an indigenous people. Uh, trail trees specifically may be used to indicate direction of water, settlement, or other significant sites. The first rec record of a trail marker tree appeared into a document called the Map of Ulmit Reservation and its Indian Reminders dated 1828 to 1844. Um, so some of the things that we can expect to find from trail trees are fragments of tools that may have been used, um, camping sites or regular burns, uh, traditionally used hunt and gathering sites, specific uh, species typically used, i.e or sorry, some of the species that would be typically used for trail trees would be hardwoods and longer lived species. So we would be looking at things like uh, red maple, sugar maple, um, oaks, uh, species that would typically be longer lived. All of the trail trees that I've noted in the province have either been birch or maple. Um, Wayfinders or trail trees are a living artifact and that alone holds so, so much value. So we've developed a work and draft for resource management when they encounter what they believe to be a trail tree or a culturally modified tree. 
This guide will provide resource managers a strict guideline as well as contact information to knowledgeable individuals who can properly identify these trees should it actually be a trail tree. And next slide. And that's it, Wulalio. Uh, thank you for giving me some time to speak about some of the projects that we've been working on uh, within our forestry department. I, of course, didn't cover all of them. Them, We are still working on, uh, on projects with NSCC to develop a forestry program that's, um, that's uh, more holistic and is inclusive of uh, MICMA views as well as some other projects. Thank you, Sherilyn. That was a very cool presentation. So interesting. <laughs> I've learned so much. So now we will open it up for some question and answers from those of you watching. So if you're watching and you have a question, please feel free to send us a message. Um, there's a chat feature here, which depending on your device, it's either on the very top or on the very bottom. So just give it a few seconds there. Let me see. Oh, we have our first question, Sherilyn. <laughs> so where can I find out more info about what the Mi'kmaq Forestry Initiative is working on? Okay, so um, our team um, through our three organizations will be happy to answer any questions that you might have about the Mi'kmaq Forestry Initiative. Um, the leads of the Mi'kmaq Forestry Initiative, of course, as I mentioned before, Elizabeth Jessam and Troy Robichaud with CMM, but anybody who is participating on the Mi'kmaq Forest Advisory Committee uh, would be happy to answer any of your questions. Great. Okay, so this, so there are a couple questions here uh, okay. about harvesting on crown lands. So the first one is, are Mi'kmaq able to go in and harvest on crown lands whenever and wherever they want? So some great examples in this question are for firewood, a Christmas tree, or materials to say build a deck or a house. That's an excellent question. So whenever and wherever we want, um, probably not wherever you want. If it's a protected area, you may not want to enter that area and harvest a tree from that area uh, because you would be depleting the resources on that site. That area is protected for a reason. Um, so make my hold right and title to the land, but it doesn't mean depleting the land. So yes, you can go and get your Christmas tree or some firewood, but it has to meet the profits criteria. So we're um, we are under negotiations with the province uh, to determine what their criteria is and whether or not we can we can try and extend our, our limits at this point in time because um, I'm not sure how many uh, cubic meters qualify under livelihood for firewood, but I, I can certainly find that number. Um, in, in addition, so depending on your location within a province, you may be able to acquire some decking materials uh, from salvage materials via parks. So for example, um, Ketchumakuchik has a great program right now where they had to just salvage about, uh, they did 1,000 hemlocks last year. They intended to do another 1,000 hemlocks this year where they removed those trees and opened up that stand through thinning. Um, and they're offering those materials to Mi'kmaq communities. Um, so if you need decking, that's an excellent resource to get your decking. Wow, that's great. So the other question here is, um, so another crown line question, is there a remediation plan in place for any harvesting of any wood on crown lands? And if so, um, was this plan developed in collaboration with the Mi'kmaq? Yep, so that would fall under the new forest uh, management model that I spoke a little bit about earlier. So the ASHGEM has been consulted on and developed with the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia, and it's uh, an ecological forestry practice um, that's very close to our new Mi'kmaq model, which will ultimately remediate that land. So we'll, we'll be repairing that land over time and uh, increasing the biodiversity of that land. Awesome. Okay. Okay, so we... Okay, so the next question we had just pop up is, do the Mi'kmaq get stumpage fees on trees that are being cut? Um, 
I know that stumpage was something that was spoke about a while ago, and I know that it's still under negotiations. Uh, COVID kind of gotten in the way of that. Uh, this is the world that we live in right now. Um, but I know it's something that still is under negotiations. I don't have an answer for that question right now, but it is something that's going through a process. We are still paying stumpage on our MFI lands, however. Great. We have another question here and it states, okay, so trees in the highlands are being harvested by paper companies like the Port Oxbury paper. Are there limitations or regulations they need to follow? Oh, of course, every commercial or industrial scale forest operation has to follow regulations. So PHP in particular, Port Hawkesbury Paper, is certified by um, FSE, the Forest Stewardship Co uh, Council certification. Um, and under the FSE requirements, PHP has to engage with right, rights holders. So that includes the McMahon, Nova Scotia. Uh, we have started a new process with PHP whereby we will be reviewing their harvest blocks. So similar to what we're doing with uh, West 4. So there is consultation, it's new, uh, but there is consultation occurring. Great. Okay, so KMKNO. Is KMKNO consulted about the harvesting of trees in Cape Breton Highlands and where the harvesting is probably outsourced to smaller independent companies, but sold to the Port Hawkesbury paper in the end? Do the companies even have to consult with the Mi'kmaq? So any land that is managed under a PHP management unit should come through consultation. If they're not, that's certainly something uh, we, the Mi'kmaq Forest Advisory, can look into. Um, and as rights holders, if it is on Crown land, it would have to come through consultation. Awesome. Oh. Okay, so this is, this is actually a kind of cool question. So I want to harvest birch bark for my artwork. Where can I go to do this? Oh, um, you can harvest your birch bark from any crown space as well as from some private wood lot. So if you have permission to go onto that private wood lot, you're more than welcome to go in and harvest that birch bark. Uh, I do have a few suggestions on how you might want to harvest um, that birch bark if you're, if you're willing to hear them. Um, so you're obviously not going to be wanting to harvest in from older trees because you can't access that younger paper like bark uh, from from below. Um, and uh, you don't want to be climbing trees in the winter. Um, and you would want to harvest from trees that are about 15 centimeters in diameter and greater. So to avoid girdling your tree. So if you're cutting a small block of um, birch bark off of a tree, you shouldn't be doing very much harm, but you have to be careful as well, not to cut too deep because if you cut too deep within that uh, bark, so your inner bark is called your xylem and your xylem is where your nutrients flow through your tree. Um, if you are, if you cut the bark from all the way around the tree, you do something that's essentially called girdling. So now those nutrients in the spring, if you harvest in, and I do highly, highly recommend only harvesting in the winter, I'll, I'll drill that one. Um, but um, if you, uh, in, in the spring, if you have harvested all around that tree, you've girdled that tree and you're preventing that nutrient flow from going back into the tree. Ultimately, uh, what happens then is the tree will die. Wow, that's very interesting and so cool to learn about. Thank you for that. Um, I think that may be the end of our questions. Um, just wait a few seconds here. Okay, so I think that brings us to the end. So I just wanna thank you again for joining us here today. And thank you, Sherilyn, for your time and your presentation. It was very cool, so interesting. Thanks again. And as always, if you have any questions or you'd like to ask after we close or are watching the recording and have questions, please feel free to email us. Thank you.